Many governments of the global north have brought into and in fact endorsed Israel's justifications for its genocidal war. But Latin American governments have been a picture in contrast. What positions have countries taken on this? The House of Commons in the UK voted on an amendment to seek a ceasefire in Palestine. What were the positions taken by various parties? And Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden met on Wednesday on the sidelines of the APEC summit. What were the outcomes? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The response of governments across the world to Israel's genocidal attack on Palestine has been revealing. Governments of the global north have strongly endorsed Israel's position, while across the global south, many have taken a strong stance against it. Latin American governments especially have been vociferous in opposing Israel's brutal war and calling for a ceasefire. To understand some of these regional dynamics, we go to Zoe Alexandra. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, quite a few interesting developments from Latin America when it comes to solidarity with Palestine governments taking a very powerful position. But let's first go to the single biggest player, the most significant player in the region, which is Brazil. And there's been a lot of, you know, fascination, a lot of interest in the stances Brazil has taken, especially President Lula, his recent comments really marking a very interesting shift. So let's first talk about Brazil and Lula's position on the Israeli attack on Gaza. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So uh, Brazil has been an interesting case um, in terms of its reaction to the situation in Gaza. Um, for a while, we saw a lot of uh, quite reserved comments, some would say, um, from Lula da Silva, whereas his counterparts in countries like Colombia, um, even in Chile, uh, had much stronger criticisms of what Israel was doing um, and, and defending um, Palestine's right uh, to resist. Uh, we saw Lula taking a more middle of the road line, uh, condemning Hamas um, and using that language, calling Hamas uh, a terrorist group um, and saying, you know, expressing solidarity first with the people of Israel. And we've seen a really uh, tremendous shift actually in what Lula has said um, regarding the situation as I, as I explained. Um, he has in the last week really upped the ante and uh, intensified his tone and his condemnations of Israel. And many believe this has to do with the fact that for a while Lula was negotiating, his government was negotiating uh, with Israel for the evacuation of Brazilian citizens from uh, the Gaza Strip. As we know, there were hundreds of foreign nationals that were in Gaza that uh, were there during um, this the genocidal bombing carried out by Israel, um, and that after several weeks, um, the border uh, opened uh, in Rafah, and Israel allowed the exit of um, a couple hundred foreign nationals. But um, as many analysts have noted, a lot of these were from countries that, no surprise, Israel is aligned with, such as the United States and European countries. And so actually the negotiation for Brazilians to be evacuated was quite uh, arduous. Um, and there were a lot of dead ends. Um, and so many suspected that Lula was uh, maintaining sort of a more moderate uh, discourse regarding Israel's actions um, due to this negotiation, not wanting to uh, anger Israel anymore. Um, and now that uh, this, this past weekend, uh, the remaining Brazilians that were in Gaza were and their family members were repatriated to Brazil. He received them in Brasilia. We've actually seen a significant uh, change in this con condemnatory tone of Israel. Uh, Lula has said that uh, Israel's not killing soldiers. Uh, he's, they're killing children. Uh, he's condemned this with the strongest terms possible. And I think that what will be interesting to see over the next week is how does this change in, in his position being such an important country in the region, um, being you know the largest, one of the largest economies in the region, um, having a serious impact globally. How will Lula's government's position impact what happens at the UN, um, what happens in other uh, international um, spaces, 
how will he, for example, put pressure on Joe Biden, understanding that uh, it's really the U.S. government that gives Israel the green light to commit all of these atrocities. As we know, just hours before the Al Shifa hospital was uh, raided by Israeli troops, the U.S. spokesperson of the White House said that they had reason to believe that it was a Hamas headquarters. So we can see this direct connection between uh, what the U.S. says and then what Israel feels it's able to do. Uh, so Lula being another key player in putting pressure on not only Israel, but also the United States will be a fundamental factor, hopefully, in changing what's happening and bringing an end uh, to this genocidal violence against the Palestinians in Gaza. Right. But uh, like you said, Lula has not been the, it's not just been about, uh, you know, Brazil, because also various other Latin American countries taking very powerful positions. So could you maybe also do an overview of the region? What are the other governments and leaders saying and what is the kind of pressure they're applying, the diplomatic pressure they're applying at this point? Well, as we've covered on People's Dispatch, Latin America has been at the forefront of a lot of uh, political and diplomatic actions to put pressure on Israel. Um, We've seen leaders such as Gustavo Petro of Colombia, uh, Gabriel Boric, Nicolas Maduro, Miguel Diaz-Canel of uh, Venezuela and Cuba, respectively, um, making very bold statements condemning what uh, Israel is doing and, and, importantly, affirming Palestine's right to resist and the historic nature of the oppression faced by Palestinians. I think this is really crucial because in the global north, we see a lot of condemnations of what um, is happening right now for the past month with the bombings, um, with the bombings of schools, with the bombings of hospitals, which many people uh, are condemning, uh, but without recognizing that this is part of uh, 75 years of violence against the Palestinian people. That's part of a settler colonial plan to exterminate Palestinians and to take all of the land uh, for Israel, the Zionist project. Um, so Latin American leaders having this clarity, having this historic clarity, um, has has really introduced that as well on the international stage and forced other other leaders to to recognize this and to come to terms with this. Um, in addition to these strong statements, several of these countries have either um, cut relations, like we saw the case of Bolivia, oh. and most recently today Belize, um, and then we've seen countries like Chile, oh. Colombia, Honduras uh, that have withdrawn uh, their ambassadors from the country. Um, for consultation. This is this is not cutting relations, but it's sending a strong message that we do not uh, approve of what your government is doing and we don't even want our diplomatic staff in the country. So this has been one move. And then additionally, this past week, Gustavo Petro uh, supported Algeria's case to the International Criminal Court um, charging Israel with genocide. And this is a call that has been made uh, by world leaders, social movements, um, and human rights organizations from across the world, um, recognizing that throughout this month, this now five weeks, uh, Israel has violated systematically international humanitarian law, um, bombing hospitals, bombing schools, killing journalists, killing medical workers, uh, killing children indiscriminately, uh, killing civilians and not trying to spare them. And so all of these are not just horrible things, but they actually constitute a violation of uh, international law. And there are bodies that do try people uh, and leaders um, for these types of crimes, and that's the International Criminal Court. Uh, as we know, uh, Israel, there was a, a case brought before the ICC several years back uh, attempting to investigate uh, Israel and the U.S. essentially said, uh, they're not going to cooperate with this, and this is ridiculous. This is not a matter for the ICC. But I think that with the growing pressure diplomatically, politically, socially against Israel, this sort of case will be crucial. And many people have raised attention to the fact that the ICC prosecu prosecutor has not taken enough uh, initiative, has not um, actually responded to the calls for this investigation. Even civil society groups brought a case to the ICC um, so this is going to continue to be a pressure point um, where global leaders, where civil society, human rights organizations are going to continue to put pressure on um, trying to end this impunity that Israel enjoys for all of the different crimes that it has committed, not just in the last month, uh, but 
historically for the past 75 years. Um, and we know that the same time that Israel is indiscriminately bombing the Gaza Strip, there's also grave violations happening to Palestinians in the West Bank, to Palestinians being held in Israeli prisons. Um, we ran a piece on People's Dispatch about the treatment of Palestinian prisoners uh, within Israeli jails over the past month, um, having their rights completely violated, um, their um, access to visits, to seeing family members, to lawyers has been completely cut off, uh, food and water withheld, showers withheld, outside time withheld, all personal belongings seized. Um, again, these are also violations of people's fundamental human rights, even um, as incarcerated people. And of course, we know that um, the majority of Palestinians are really uh, held just for the simple uh, fact of them being Palestinians and daring to resist. So um, these are very key. Colombia has supported this ICC plea, um, and we're gonna see how that evolves again it will be interesting to see what happens now that Lula, who again for many is not only a leader of one of the world's most important economies, but in many senses a moral leader, um, now that he has intensified his criticisms, how will this play out? Uh, what other actions on the international stage could take place uh, to continue to put even more pressure on Israel and its business uh, of genocide? The House of Commons in the United Kingdom on Wednesday voted on an amendment which urged the country to join the international community in calling for a ceasefire in Palestine. Now, this was an interesting vote mainly because of the question of what position Labour MPs would take. Labour leader Keir Starmer has been strongly on Israel's side and has been widely criticised for it even within his party. Ultimately, while the resolution was not passed, 56 of 198 Labour MPs voted in support of a ceasefire against the party leader's line. We go to Anish for details. Anish, thank you for joining us. Interesting vote in the House of Commons. The British government, of course, has taken a very, you know, a problematic, regressive position as far as the Israeli war is concerned, of course. And we saw recently Suela Breverman being sacked for what is really a view of a lot of conservatives. But all eyes were on Labour, the Labour Party yesterday, especially because of the stance of its leaders. So let's first talk about that. How do you see the vote? Uh, the vote is quite interesting. It actually uh, shows the kind of divisions that have always existed within uh, the Labour Party on various issues, and it's not just Palestine. Uh, in this case, obviously, what we have always expected, the left wing within the Labour Party, uh, many of whom represent trade unions uh, or you know other socialists, uh, voted uh, along with the Scottish nationalists uh, in favor of the amendment uh, to the, the the government's bill. Obviously, the amendment was uh, voted uh, out uh, with only 125 voting, if I'm not wrong. Uh, uh, but uh, most of Labour uh, voting against it as well. Uh, but obviously, what we're looking at is a division uh, that came despite threats from the leadership that anybody who voted against uh, the Labour Party's amendment or their stand uh, or their leadership stand actually uh, would be uh, sacked from the party. Now they they have about uh, a, near more than a quarter of their MPs uh, doing exactly that, and it uh, it's, it remains to be seen what kind of action they are willing to take at this point in time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the left uh, the fact that the left uh, took the stand is quite significant. The fact that they are not uh, going to go down that easy. Uh, is something that is evident that was evident yesterday. But on top of that, uh, there were others who were not uh, part of the traditional left within the labor, and many who were part of the so-called moderate or soft left, uh, who supported the amendment, uh, the SNP amendment as well. And so that clearly shows that there was, uh, you know, a significant shift, uh, not a shift, but a, a divide a rift of a sort uh, within the Labour Party that cannot be uh, done away with whatever, uh, you know, explanation uh, Guy Starmer uh, talks about uh, when he talks about, uh, you know, whatever terrorist attack uh, or, you know, how he characterizes Palestine's, uh, you know, uh, resistance movement exactly. Uh, and uh, it also clearly shows that much of the Labour leadership right now is completely cut off from uh, much of, you know, Labour Party's own uh, constituents most of whom do support the Palestinian cause, most of whom see the Israeli occupation as, uh, you know, as an occupation, a colonial occupation as well. So there is significant uh, uh, damage that was done, obviously, to this sort of invincibility, this image of invincibility that Starmer 
had created around himself over the past few years, especially after his so-called purge of, uh, you know, pro-Corbyn uh, uh, groups within the rank and file uh, very recently. Well, Anish, in this context, uh, uh, you mentioned Kaish Saman. That was something I wanted to talk about as well. This is not the first issue on which he has received vast amounts of criticism from uh, the leftist sections, the progressive sections in Labour. We know how we stand on trade unions for that matter. But what does seem to be the case is this kind of consensus among the leaderships of the Conservative and Labour Party when it comes to an issue like this. And of course, the Conservative government's position itself has been very, like I said earlier, very regressive. As well. so could it maybe take us through what position the UK is taking on this issue? The UK has pretty much stood uh, the United States line, which is that uh, there cannot be a ceasefire. They think that a ceasefire is going to, quote unquote, embolden Hamas, which they deem as a terrorist organization. Uh, and they do not uh, account for uh, thousands of people who are killed. The fact that much of the people who have been killed so far, more than 11,000 or uh, so people, uh, of them, most of them were uh, children, women, and elderly, uh, a bulk of them actually, and it's not just like even 50%, it's a huge majority of them were uh, unarmed, completely unarmed civilians. Uh, most of them come from very weak sections of the of the Gazan population. So this, uh, you know, lack of uh, accounting for that fact, uh, that aspect of the current conflict, and only accounting for the number of deaths uh, on the Israeli side, clearly shows that they are trying to present uh, uh, you know, uh, an argument which pretty much the Israelis love right now, uh, which is that uh, the whole of Gaza is, uh, you know, a terrorist organization right now and needs to be done away with. And that uh, is pretty much what uh, you see in different uh, versions uh, from the conservatives and even the labor leadership right now. Obviously, the labor party had to uh, do away with uh, uh, some of the most, uh, you know, unhinged kind of uh, pro-Israeli uh, statements uh, and had to add some level of, uh, you know, acknowledgement that a disproportionate number of Gazans have been killed, uh, but they definitely stopped short of criticizing Israel for, a, be it its occupation or the blockade or the fact that no aid has been allowed inside or the fact that they have been cut off from electricity and so on and so forth. The kind of atrocities that have happened for the past month or so, and this clearly shows that the the you know the the sort of Blair right left has come back, uh, the Labour has come back, and they have really pretty much taken that same position uh, twenty years ago, and uh, we are seeing that same thing right now. Uh, the uh, the conservatives are nothing uh, you know surprising actually. They have always taken that position. They have in fact used uh, you know any kind of criticism against Israel uh, as an uh, to attack the left hand, especially Corbyn during labor. And we saw that happening, uh, this whole allegation of anti-Semitism at the time, uh, you know, disproportionately uh, taken out of uh, uh, context. Nevertheless, uh, this is pretty much showing the line. Uh, and we see the same thing happening with several Western leadership who do not see ceasefire as anything, uh, do not see ceasefire as anything preferable. They prefer pauses, which might happen for hours, which might happen for maybe a, a day or two, uh, if they are generous, uh, if Israel is generous. And also they give Israel the complete control over how they want to uh, continue the conflict, even if it means thousands are going, thousands more are going to be killed in the coming days. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that. We'll come back to you for our next story as well. And Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden met after nearly a year at San Francisco. The meeting produced several outcomes, including a decision to resume military-to-military -military communications. We go back to Anish for more. Well, Anish, we discussed the meeting in the uh, before it happened as a run-up, so to speak. And, uh, of course, uh, much of what we talked about sort of actually taking place. Of course, there's a dictator comment at the end, which we'll probably come to. But first, let's talk about the substantive outcomes uh, of this summit in terms of what were the major agreements, which is what, what I think everyone is looking forward to. Well, the biggest accomplishment of the meeting right now is that the military to military talks are going to resume, uh, which is pretty much uh, a reset of, uh, you know, relations between the US and China. If you actually think of it in the context of, you know, the past several years, this is not much of a major achievement. Uh, it is just that talks are going to happen. And that's pretty much what they have achieved right now. Um, on the other hand, they are going to cooperate. Uh, they have agreed to cooperate on various issues, including climate change, 
which is significant considering the next uh, COP26 uh, meeting happening very shortly. And the two countries are going to be the major uh, players and the ones who would be setting the narrative. So if there is some level of cooperation, um, which would be uh, inter interesting to see because both countries have taken very drastically different stand when it comes to climate change, especially when it comes to who should feed the responsibility of climate change and the pollution for the past uh, century or so. Uh, on the other hand, there are uh, going to be some level of cooperation on AI, uh, which is something that has already, uh, that has been a matter of concern around the world. So these two, uh, again, uh, some of the leading powers right now in the technological advancements. Uh, so definitely they are going to be, there is going to be some significant uh, movement on that matter. But nevertheless, the ultimate result of this meeting has been that they're going to keep talking. And that is pretty much what uh, has been achieved. And it, it is not, uh, I mean, I, sh I, I would say like we have to be very because as I said, as you pointed out, there was this very random comment that happened that was in, in fact instigated by a journalist uh, in, uh, through Biden uh, on uh, calling uh, Xi Jinping a dictator. Uh, but uh, so that clearly shows that you can never really you know, be very sure of how the U.S. is going to take this matter forward, how far this going, to, this uh, sort of cooperation is going to continue. Uh, because even when we talk about uh, the post-meeting statements by the two countries, there has been a very significant divergence, especially when it came to Taiwan, where uh, Biden, the side, the U.S. side, kept saying that Biden insisted that Taiwan cannot be invaded or so on and so forth, and that the U.S. is going to take, uh, you know, keen interest in how uh, things move along in Taiwan. On the other hand, uh, China says that it is a very, uh, you know, clearly insisted that Taiwan, the matter of Taiwan is between Taiwan and China, and that uh, even though uh, there will be uh, no, in, uh, you know, immediate invasion uh, of the island, uh, it is definitely going to be uh, you know, a matter of reunification for ch the Chinese side. So that sort of divergence also clearly shows that the U.S. can obviously take this up in the future and rankle the tensions if it wants to. So that kind of thing is already there and that we see that wariness on the Chinese side, especially in their media reports and even how the governments have framed some of their statements. Right, but I guess in the short term, in the absence of any major provocations, we might see meetings between top officials continue and, you know, uh, the momentum of discussion, so to speak, which has been building up over the past few months might to some extent continue, even if there are no substantial breakthroughs. Exactly, uh, because this is something that is the most practical thing to do at this point. We are, uh, there was a couple of months ago, we were talking about uh, how the US and, the, uh, and its allies were try talking about this uh, delinking with China and, uh, you know, trying to isolate it economically, but that was not possible. Uh, on top of that, the fact that China was starting to uh, impose some really uh, dear sanctions on especially uh, on the export of some of the rare earth minerals that really uh, had its own impact in the man uh, in pushing the United States to uh, you know to come to this the, the sort of practical terms rather than uh, you know uh, resort to uh, war mongering and you know tension mongering on uh, in the region at this point. So definitely uh, this sort of uh, we, we hope that this sort of practical uh, foreign policy continues in the coming uh, years even. Uh, but uh, definitely there is some level of wariness, uh, but that aside, it is, uh, it is some advancement, some progress that can actually, uh, that many have really looked forward to at this point in time. Right. Thank you, Anish, so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you on some similar issues in future episodes as well. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. Do come back for tomorrow's episode as well. In the meantime, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all those social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, do hit that subscribe button.